I'm Hugh Gibb, I'm the bar manager at the Sheraton at Brunswick. Uh, I believe gin is very much a, a major focus of the, of the offer here in the bar. Yes, yeah, we stock 52 different gins. Um, the number is constantly changing depending on what we get in or what we choose to, to stock. Um, it's not the biggest range, but it's the most considered range. What, what, what makes you decide that you're going to stock one particular gin? Presumably you've got the choice of hundreds. Why do you decide on, on say, Heyman's Old Tom Gin rather than any other? Well, Heyman's, the reason why we chose Heyman's is because it's an old Tom gin, so it's quite a different category compared to the rest of the gins. Um, but in terms of all the gins we stock, we try and stock as many as different as possible, so um, ones that have different botanicals, or different methods of distillation, uh, different regions, um, and basically we try and stock things that, that we think are interesting to people. Because everyone's seen the same bottles everywhere they go, this is more about you know, bringing spirits to people that haven't really seen them before. So things like Chandari and Bloom, um, Barrels Reserve, these are all things that people don't see in most bars or in shops. So can you talk us through the different styles of gin and what's, for example, is the difference between a London gin and an old Tom gin? What's the... Sure, so basically London gin is what everyone knows and thinks of as gin in the head, that's what gin is to most people. Um, old Tom gin is a different category, it's a different style together, essentially it's a sweetened gin. Um, it came about basically because people were drinking gin at that time in London and it was very coarse, so they had to sweeten it. And in those days they sweetened it with daffodils, dandelion, meadows, anything they could get their hands on basically. Um, these days it's not hugely popular, in the 20s it was popular for the cocktails like Old Tom Collins, things like that. Um, but nowadays it's more as a sort of a cocktail ingredient rather than gin for martinis or, or gin tonics. Um, a London dry gin is what everyone, like said, everyone kind of knows thinks of a gin. But London dry basically means that it's distilled once. Um, it's not added to anything after the fact. You can sweeten it slightly or add the base spirit, but you can't add any more botanicals after the fact. So London dry gin is essentially the purest gin style or category. Um, Thin like Plymouth is another style of gin. People kind of think gin and they just think it's one category, but there is all these different styles in the it. Um, Plymouth basically has to be made in Plymouth. I think the rule is it's like six kilometres off of Blackfriars Abbey, which is in the middle of Plymouth. Um, at the time, there was a huge amount of distilleries in Plymouth because of the Navy, a lot of gin went out in the Mayflower ship and into the New World, but nowadays it's basically the only one you can really get. Um, Moving on from London Dry, you get things that they branch themselves out in a sort of artisanal or small batch. Um, basically it means it's under 300 litres um, and it's made in two steps. So they make their, their base spirit and their base distillate and then after the fact they add in extra botanicals or sweeten it or to get the finished part. Afterwards. So things like Gin Mari, um, Karun, Hendrix, these are all not London Dries. But London Dry doesn't have to be made in London, it can make it anywhere. It's, it's a style of London, London, regional. Uh, yeah. uh, and can you tell us a little bit about the history of gin? I mean, people think that gin is such a big, um, uh, a sort of British drink. Can you tell us why it became popular in, in, in the UK? In the UK, well, basically in the UK at the wow. time, when gin first came to the UK, it came as Geneva. Uh, Geneva is a Dutch spirit. It's more similar to a malt than a gin. Um, but the reason it was so popular in the UK when it came over is that it was extremely expensive to buy beer. There was a huge tax on beer at the time, so your average Joe couldn't afford a pint in the tavern. Um, so these sort of basic early gins were what everyone was drinking because you could get a glass for a penny, effectively. Um, and that's where it came into its sort of its element in London and Britain at the time. But because of its connotations, uh, it was basically a poor man's spirit. It had a lot of blame put on it for the nation's ill. Pictures like Hogarth, all his eyes, you know, generally things like that. They you know, it didn't help Jim's quite um, So it became hugely popular. Um, but after that, as it moved through the ages, it became popular as a sort of higher society drink. Um, in the 20s, in Prohibition, um, basically, Gin was one of the hugest things because you could make it yourself and you could import it easily and it was clear so you could get away with drinking it. People didn't know what you were drinking so it was very, very popular to drink. Um, and then as you go through, I mean gin's always been a constant through all the sort of periods in the 60s it was hugely popular, 70s, um, one of the biggest sellers in Chicago 54, believe it or not. Um, and then as you get into the 80s and 90s it kind of waned quite a bit um, and that's kind of around the time where vodka took prevalence. Um, 
late 90s, early 1000s, it was from things like that. And it's only recently, the last sort of five or six years, it's become a massive spirit again. Back to this, as popular probably as it's ever been. I think uh, gin is very popular with bartenders. It's a great cocktail base. Can, can you tell us why it's a why yeah? It's I mean, so gin for, 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 well, for cocktail bartenders, they like basically to experiment um, and any excuse to make drinks that haven't been made before. It's what they live for, and gin is a perfect base spirit to do that with because of the amount of botanicals um, that are in these spirits. There's also infinite possibilities of what you can do with the spirit. Whereas something like a vodka based cocktail is basically going to taste like whatever you flavour with because the, the base spirit tastes of nothing. Whereas botanicals, depending on what's in it, you can have a very citrusy cocktail, you can have a very herbal cocktail, quite floral, depending on the gin you use. Um, so it's a, it's a much more malleable spirit to use. That you can take bits and pieces from all sorts of different things to get your finished cocktail. So bartenders really have jumped on gin. Plus a lot of the sort of classic cocktails the bartenders learn very early on, they are gin based. Um, and if you go through you know, books on cocktail history, gin is you know, really dominant throughout the whole thing. And can you tell us a bit about botanicals? Botanicals are the, are the, 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 the herbs, the spices yeah, that used to flavor. I mean basically all gin has to have a juniper flavour to it, or a predominant juniper taste and smell. So juniper is the main ingredient in all gins, essentially. Um, but other than that, things like cardamom, bergamot orange, um, anything that's a sort of herbal botanical, essentially, is what's used in most gins. Um, most of the gins have the same botanicals at their base. It's like a perfume almost, but a lot of perfumes have the same sort of be sandalwood or anything like that. And then and the layers on top of that is where you put in your different talents and give your gin a specific taste. So can, like. can you tell us about, I mean, it seems as though gin has had a bit of renaissance in Scotland recently. Can you tell yeah. us how, how that started? Uh, probably, I think it would start with Hendrix. I mean, Hendrix is the, it's kind of the most you know, widely known Scottish gin. Um, and they really came to the foreground because of how they served it and they weren't really shouting about what was in it. Um, I mean historically a lot of companies were really secret about what they had in their gin, they didn't want to give away the recipe, whereas now a lot of gins are say down the side of the bottom so saying if you want if you want to know. But Hendrix were more concerned about how it was served and presented and they had a slice of cucumber rather than traditional citrus fruit and that really captured everyone's imagination, yeah. certainly behind the bar as well as other side of the bar because it was so different. Um, and it kind of changed people's perspectives of, of what James Hunt was or how it was served. Uh, so they really started it, um, and now, I mean, there's a huge amount of other Scottish gins, Caroon from Persia, Pickerings from Edinburgh, it's the first gin for 150 years to be still in Edinburgh, um, North Berwick gins, another one, Edinburgh gins been going for a while. I mean, there's a huge amount of, of Scottish gins, um, I mean, even things like Old Ranch, which is from the bottle, you wouldn't think it was Scottish um, because of the branding, but when that company was formed in the 70s, gin was still really seen as a colonial and, and sort of an English spirit, so they kind of like to stick with that. Um, but at the moment, it seems to be, because of such a demand from, from people who want to know about gin and want to try new gins, um, there has been a real you know, boom, especially in Scottish gin. Fantastic. Can you, can you talk us through perhaps what um, what gins are best for different drinks? I mean, for example, if you were to make a martini, mm. what what gin would you use? Martinis, I mean, historically, martinis were usually it was a very heavy juniper-based gin. <clears throat> so something like I mean, Plymouth gin is still very popular in the states for a martini because it's a very juniper-heavy style. And the American gins tend to be better suited because the main botanicals are juniper and they don't really add in too much extra. Um, I mean, there is obviously all the other things like licorice and, and orange root and whatever else, but <coughs> excuse me, the, the juniper really comes to the, the forefront of those martinis. But in saying that, you still get people who want a sort of slightly sweeter or fruitier martinis, so things like Tanky 10, um, Beef Eater 24, which is another addition of Beef Eater that's got more citrus through it. Um, these ones tend to work quite well for martinis. But again, I mean, you could go on for it. If you want a dirty martini, you can go to a Spanish gym. Um, this one's really good because it's got added um, olives in it already, so you don't need the extra brine to make the dirty martini. You get the flavour from the olives in the gym. So, um, it really is down to personal preference. Some people want a Hendrix martini because they like the fresh, crisp cucumber taste to it. Um, some people want a slightly sweeter one, so they might want an old Tom martini. Um, it is quite a good spirit because there is something for everyone. It's one of those things people kind of think, 
they're not a huge gym fan immediately, they think in their head, mm, I don't really like gym. But if you have all these different ones, there's something for you. It's just a gym you haven't found yet. Basically. That's the thing. So, it is, when we do the gym tasting here, there's always, especially in the bigger groups, there's usually one who's not a huge gym fan. They don't drink it. Um, but usually, I haven't yet found someone in a gym tasting, but by the end of the day, I really can drink it. I actually do like gym. It's just they haven't had one that they've liked yet. And a lot of it's down to how people are introduced to the sport as well. If they haven't had it, you know, served in you know, the best possible way, what they could potentially have is something that's really insipid and it kind of just turns them off the whole category from the start. So. Whereas if you do it right, then obviously you've got a friend for life. Yeah, well, that's essentially that's how it works, yeah. We'll try that, that's the best way of doing it. But the thing is with the, the gin is that a lot of people are coming back to it because they the kind of group like bored of drinking this one day and beef is the same thing or going to a bar and that's all that's available. Um, there's now there's so much out there um, and people are more concerned now about the whole drink rather than just I want a tank for the time. So I want a tank for and fever tree with pink grapefruit. You know, they want the whole the whole thing. And the people that, that they are brand calling Yeah, the I mean, brand calling used to just, just exist tonic. just with the spirit. Um, yeah. but now it's going down the lines of the tonic and the garnish and everything like that. Um, we have had guests ask specifically for Seville lemons and things like that. You know, but it's good, in, from my point of view, it's good that people are taking that much care and they're asking for over a bar because it's quite a new concept. Um, before, people would definitely brand call certain spirits, but the whole drink um, they wouldn't really care that much about. Whereas the last sort of two or three years, people have become really, really interested in what goes into it, why you're using a pink grapefruit, why you're using a bit of rosemary, and things like that. So,